Well, welcome class. Today we're going to talk about meiosis. We've already talked about mitosis when we take tissue or somatic cells and they divide for growth and repair. Meiosis, on the other hand, is a process in where gametes or sex cells are made. So there's some special conditions that we want to go over today. Before we talk about the process, I really want to go over some of the terminology so you have it a little bit more clear in your head as we go through this. So one of the words I, I would like to talk about today is haploid. Haploid means you have basically half the complement of, of chromosomes you need for an adult individual. Haploid cells tend to be uh, found in gametes. They typically have like one end of a set of, of chromosomes. So we're really talking about just one particular set, like from a father, like the sperm cells, or the mother, like the egg cells. So we represent that with one end. So if a cell has one N or haploid number of chromosomes, that means they have exactly half of what they should have, like you'll find in sex cells. And if you take a look at the, the picture that I've uh, provided for you over here, uh, haploids right here, and this means that it has half the complement of, of cells that an adult would. That brings us up to the second word I want to talk about is diploid. It means you have two sets of chromosomes. And the diploid is referred to as a 2N. So in this particular case, you can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's a complete set of uh, chromosomes or a diploid set. Again, adults, whether it be plant or animal, uh, will have a, no, most of the time, anyway, will have a diploid number um, or 2N number of chromosomes. Where, like, if it was pollen or it was an ovum or an egg, um, it's going to have diploid or 1N. So in humans, a 2N or a complete set of chromosomes, half from mother, half from father, would be 46 chromosomes. Of those 46, we have um, basically 22 chromosomes plus a sex cell, 23 altogether, uh, would uh, come from mother or father. And those, uh, those kind, the 22 sets are autosomes. Uh, they're, they're anything but the sex cells. So just to, just to kind of quickly review, for instance, your particular sperm or egg would have 23 chromosomes. 22 of them would be the autosomes, the things it tells you, the various characteristics, your height, your weight, your eye color, skin color, all that stuff. And then the other set would be your sex cells. Like in, in a male, it would be XY, female would be XX. Well, there are a couple, when we're talking about cell division, there are a couple of ways of, of going about cell division. One is asexually. So in asexual uh, reproduction, basically um, mitosis uh, is a thing that will multiply your cells. Um, but in this particular case, we have a picture here of Dolly the sheep. A Dolly the sheep was born, or maybe even made, in 1996 by a gentleman named um, Ian Wilmot. Uh, Mr. or our Dr. Uh, Wilmot was from Edinburgh, Scotland. And what he did, him and his colleagues, what they did is they took a Scottish black-faced sheep, took the egg, and then scooped out, blew out the nucleus. And so they set that enucleated egg off to the side. And then what they did is went to another sheep, a Finn Dorset sheep, which is a, obviously a white face a sheep, and then what they would do is they took a cell from the udder of, of one of theirs um, using the flock, cultured it in dishes, then extracted some cells and, and basically blew it right back into that enucleated egg, shocked it with uh, some voltage, and voila, they had a die of the sheep. Now, the one thing about Dolly is that, first of all, mitosis was the thing that basically created her. There was no exchange of egg and sperm. Dolly didn't really have a mother and father. They just took the somatic cell um, of the, the udder of a dorset fin sheep and then grew it in a petri dish. So Dolly is an exact copy of the lamb that she got herself from. But the other thing about it is when you're, um, when you're growing cells in an asexual reproduction situation, they go very, very quickly. But the other drawback is, even though that Dolly was an exact genetic copy, 
she lacked a lot of diversity in, in terms of her genetics. Now, the other way that uh, cells can be divided is through sexual reproduction. That means there's an exchange of gametes, like uh, uh, egg and sperm. Now, this is a black belly calf that you see in front of you. And you can see that the, the, the uh, face is white, and it has uh, white underneath its belly and, and on its legs, and then basically the body hair is going to be black. This particular um, breed comes from the breeding of an Angus and a Hereford. And uh, what they contribute, of course, is egg and sperm. When the egg and sperm of these particular cattle come together, they form a black baldy. So it needs egg, it needs sperm, and when they come together, then those particular traits are also shared. So if you take a look at the black baldy, you'll notice you get the black hair from the Angus, and the color pattern, as far as the white was concerned, comes from the Hereford. And when they come together, of course, they form this, this, form, this black baldy uh, calf that you see in front of you. Now, some of the characteristics of that kind of reproduction is, first of all, you definitely need haploid cells. You need a combination of haploid from a mother, haploid from the father, and then they come together. Again, the egg and the sperm come together to form a complete individual. When that egg and sperm form, they form what they call a zygote, which will eventually become that individual. So gametes are needed for this particular um, process. The zygote, though, uh, when all of that genetic information comes together, is going to be diploid. That means it has two sets of instructions, half of it from mother, half of it from father. And the great thing also that's different than the asexual is meiosis causes great amount of diversity. Now, if you take a look at this black baldy, you'll notice some character traits from the mother, character traits from the father, and... But it still ha it's got its own look. It still looks like itself, but you can see some characteristics between the two. But there are still diversity, great amounts of diversity, um, because there's a constant exchange through a process called crossing over, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the chromosomes and how they're set up, because I'll be using some terms interchangeably, and I want you to be able to, to understand what I'm doing. All right, when we take a look at these chromosomes, these are called homologous chromosomes. And homologous chromosomes are similar chromosomes. They're not identical, they're just similar. Similar in their height, or length I should say. Uh, similar in the position of the centromere. Similar in their staining properties. So that would be homologous chromosomes. Now, if you notice, in this particular uh, molecule chromosome, when the centromere is attached, and, and of course, spindle fibers are attached to the centromere, when that happens, you can call these, when they have come together, sister chromatids. So when uh, those two particular homologous chromosomes come together with the centromere, they're not identical. They're similar, though, um, in, in their length and all that other things that I just mentioned. When they come together, that's called sister chromatids. Now, during the first phase, or the first couple of phases of um, meiosis, what's going to happen is these homologous chromosomes will join with another group, and they'll form what we call a tetrad. So here's an example of a tetrad. So a tetrad is basically two pairs coming together and, and locking up. And the reason they do that is they're going to intertwine each other like this. And it will be two non-sister chromatids who will kind of exchange or lock together. And then when they're locked together like that, they're going to actually exchange genetic information. So that the end result is a great amount of diversity. So if you look at the color patterns, and if you look... Tr Let me erase that real quick. If you take a look at this one compared to this one, you'll notice that it's similar, but there's still some differences here. Same with this one. If you take a look at this one, they have some similarities, but there's a difference. And they can exchange information in different places depending on how they intertwine or lock up. So that's how a lot of diversity can get done in meiosis. So let's go ahead and start with the process. There are some similar similarities between mitosis and meiosis. And um, at the end, we'll kind of compare them uh, as well. 
But right away, you're going to see some differences in, in prophase. If you take a look at prophase, you can see that the nuclear envelope is starting to break up, enzymes are starting to break it down. Uh, but also, you can see that already the, uh, the chromosomes have already duplicated and kind of condensed, but they're already crossing over. They're already linking up. And here's one right here. Here's another one right here. And then we have another one right here and another one right there. And they're already intertwining and exchanging genetic information. So these are already forming the tetrads that I've talked about. That doesn't happen in prophase in mitosis. But in uh, meiosis, on the first part, not only is there duplication, but also crossing over is going on, as well as the, um, uh, uh, the nucleus starting to fall apart. And then what t happens here, let's go back here. In this particular case, what happens here is it lines up right down the uh, midplane just like in mitosis, but again, these are these are going to be this part right here. These are the tetrads or homologs, and what's going to happen is those tetrads tetrads will actually be pulled apart front to the poles, just like in regular uh, metaphase. But again, it's the tetrads that are that are forming um, up on the center, not just the single the singular um, uh, sister chromatids. Then we get the anaphase, the tetrads are separated completely, and they're being pulled to the pole. So again, if you take a look, there is one, so that these are now sister chromatids. And then in telophase, again, what's going to happen is it's going to form a, a cell plate right there and break the, uh, the homologs into different poles or different... Um, uh, different parts of the uh, of uh, uh, the cell. So, what happens here at the very end? We're going to have two cells, two cells um, with two pairs of chromosomes in there. Let's go back to this just real quick. I want you to kind of keep an, an eye on this for just a second. Notice on on this one right here, we basically have four cells, or excuse me, four chromosomes, one, two, three, and four, and we had basically one cell. So keep that in mind as we move to the next one. All right, now in prophase two, notice on this particular one, there is no DNA replication. So in prophase, all they're doing at this particular point in time is kind of kind of jockeying for position. The spindle fibers are starting to lock on to the centromeres. That's the main thing. There's no reproduction or uh, duplication is being doing it here at all. It's right now. It's just the uh, spindle fibers attaching. Then we go to, to metaphase again. They line up along the center plate again with the spindle fibers. Then we go to anaphase. It, it's separated by the poles. Now, this time, now these are the sister chromatids right here. Now, the sister chromatids are broken, and now we have these chromosomes right here. And notice on this case, instead of one cell, we have four cells. And notice, instead of having four chromosomes, there's two chromosomes. So basically what has happened is we've made more cells but half amount of the of the chromosomal material is in each cell, and these will turn into to gametes, a sperm in if it's if it's for a male, or eggs if it's a female. So we kind of completed that particular phase. Now, I'm going to look at this again, and give you an, a, a, a kind of a, a, an opportunity to see that meiosis is a little bit different than mitosis in that number one is going to produce four cells with half the amount of material, genetic material, or, or basically a haploid number, and it's going to increase diversity by a thing called uh, crossing over. And we already talked about that already, but let me go ahead and write it up, up here. And again, what crossing over is, is when the tetrads are formed, it has to be in this tetrad configuration. And then non-sister chromatids are intertwining. They're exchanging information so that the resulting crosses 
will improve will um, allow uh, information to be exchanged so there's more diversity. So that's how um, we get more diversity in meiosis than mitosis. Just real quick, this is what we started with. Right here we have the 2n equals 6 chromosomes. We start with 6 chromosomes. If mitosis takes over, you know at the end of the day you're going to have twice as many cells with the same amount of uh, chromosomes. In this particular case, what's going to happen is we're going to get these chromosomes duplicate themselves, but then they're going to form tetrads, and we're going to have crossing over and tetrad formation. So that's different. Also, what's going to happen in, in metaphase one, if you can see it here, the, the sister chromatids lined up, but here the tetrads lined up, another difference. Then these homologs will be pulled apart so that in anaphase, or anaphase one and telophase one, we're, we're just dealing with these, now these sister, these homolo, uh, um, homologous chromosomes, but they're changed, they're different than when they started through. And then at the end, when we go through meiosis two, we're going to have four cells. And in this case, we started with six, we're going to end up with three chromosomes. Half as much, but four times as many cells. Now, uh, in today's lab, we're going to be doing two things. Half of you are going to be um, putting together a PowerPoint presentation or a screenshot. And the other half of you are going to be using the microscope lab so you can actually see the, the cells as, uh, as they really are. So we'll be using the digital uh, microscopes to, 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 first of all, identify all the different phases and, of course, uh, put them in order um, in your data logger. So I hope this will help. And uh, watch this particular video again if you have any um, uh, questions or come see me in the lab. And uh, we'll see you a little bit later. Thanks.